Are you looking for a convenient way to um, effectively uh, manage uh, stem cell uh, rehab, uh, post-stem cell uh, procedures? Um, if so, you're in the right place. I'm going to go over uh, what a typical three-month protocol would be for uh, a um, stem cell procedure on an on a patient on an active individual now this is a guideline this is not here an end-all be-all uh, this is an opportunity for you to provide guidelines to patients and athletes who are recovering from a very um, particular procedure and as you go through this evaluation of this of this protocol what you need to consider is um, what are the risks and how will this affect my patient just remember people undergo stem cell procedures because um, they're at a point where they were unable to find um, healing through either surgery or they're trying to avoid surgery or they've done other types of injections and this is another alternative route through regenerative medicine that they're applying. So as you go through this rehab protocol, uh, less is more. Uh, be more conservative. If anything fails, uh, lower the risk uh, and be sure to communicate with the, uh, the surgeon or the uh, provider uh, who provided the stem cells and then obviously the patient. So I'm going to run through uh, these techniques and um, how you can implement them on your own. Um, this is a protocol um, that we use at Sports Performance uh, Physical Therapy in San Diego, California. Uh, we have a practice where uh, we provide uh, comprehensive care to um, professional athletes, uh, community goers, and we see this uh, procedure quite often. And so this is a guide to help you uh, wherever you are uh, helping your local community. So one of the things I want to start here is, um, you know, in the early phases, in that first month, what you really want to do is protect the healing tissue. So um, just know that they're in that remodeling phase, inflammatory for the first three days, uh, proliferative phase for the first 21 days. This is where uh, they're typically going through uh, stitches and uh, and having those removed if, if there are any. Um, and uh, at this point, you you ultimately want to have your patient uh, moving, uh, not sedentary, like complete rest, uh, but do you don't want you do want them uh, moving and and uh, no uh, anti-inflammatories for approximately six weeks. Uh, you're creating a, an inflammatory response within the body. And so a lot of times you'll find that um, uh, uh, physicians will not recommend anti-inflammatories to allow that healing process to happen. Uh, and so physical therapy starts within the first three to six days and a minimum of three months. That's just so that way uh, you can provide guidance. And, and typically you don't see in protocols that there's a minimum of physical therapy. And this is only because if you allow patients to go too hard, too fast, too soon, um, they'll go hard out of the gate. They'll start moving. Um, they'll take anti-inflammatories. And now uh, we're wasting time, energy, and effort uh, to be able to do this effectively. And uh, you want the three months so that way you can continue to provide guidance and what I call bumpers to allow these patients uh, to know what to do and when. And finally, at that three-month mark, when you have uh, good healing happening, uh, you can transition them back into return to sport and those type of things. So let's walk through it. Um, in that first month, you're typically going to have have uh, soreness for the first two, uh, two to four weeks, um, protect the inflammatory area. It's truly just pain management and, and, and movement. Uh, you can get them into light exercise with no resistance. So uh, in the pool, uh, they could be walking. You don't want to have a lot of loaded stress or progressive overload in that first month. So those first two weeks, what you're doing is you're working on passive range of motion, active range of motion, all the normal ways that you would be post-operative. Um, you can do a little bit of light manual therapy just to um, flush the tissue out. Um, light walking, uh, uh, heat and ice uh, if that's something that they need uh, in the last two weeks. So the first two weeks is protect the tissue. Don't flare them up. Just have them move active range of motion, passive range of motion. Uh, in weeks three to four, now that you're getting closer to that remodeling phase, uh, you now have active assistive range of motion and active range of motion. So in that first one, we had passive and active assisted. Weeks three and four, you're going active assisted and active range of motion. Um, this is where you start to introduce the light isometrics. First two weeks, just don't mess with it. Leave them alone. Uh, active assistive and, and passive passive range. Now you're starting to do uh, active uh, range of motion. So you can start, you know, isometrics and those type of things, low impact to exercises in the pool, on the bike, on the elliptical, uh, and don't exceed 50% of intensity of uh, RPE, the rate of perceived exertion. Um, so this is just the introduction. So first two weeks, uh, get them moving lightly. Uh, next uh, two weeks within that first month is uh, now you have a little bit of light uh, isometric resistance and active
active range of motion uh, with very, very low intensity. Um, so that'll give you a guide, whether it's the shoulder, whether it's the back, whatever it's, it's the knee, um, it's the same principles uh, exist. So in month two, is uh, where you actually introduce uh, body weight resistance and now you can actually have a little bit more progressive overload uh, where you can have running and stairs and hiking those type of things reestablish uh, neuromuscular control with active range of motion flexibility and general mobility uh, in weeks five and six here's what, what's happening this is month two so the first two weeks you got them moving uh, real light uh, passive range of motion last two weeks you got them with active range of motion and they started a bit, little bit of uh, um, uh, exercise in terms of walking and being in the pool now that you have that set you can now move forward into body weight exercises so weeks five and six you're doing isotonic exercise you got uh, isometric in weeks uh, three and four now you're going isotonic and body weight uh, you're going to start some core and hip stabilization exercises you're you're now able to push a little bit more now you're getting to that six week mark there are certain num uh, certain markers that you have to get past get past the two week uh, mark with no flare-ups get past the six week mark with no flare-ups and get it past the 12 week mark with no flare-ups and that allows them to transition safely into sport so if all else fails get them to two weeks no flare-ups six and 12 those are your big key markers so in weeks five to six you're starting the core stabilization exercises light uh, isotonic and um, you can start to get some uh, some forces through those joints um, but uh, uh, minimize how much intensity has happened um, in the last two weeks of week month two seven and eight um, you can start having a little bit of light resistance uh, body weight so like yoga and pilates are great for mild moderate um, you know aerobic exercises uh, this is just to keep uh, blood flow um, once you've passed that six point mark or six week point mark, and now you can uh, start to load them a little bit more in month three is where you're really establishing them like slowly returning to sport and introduction to weight training. Uh, so I said at week six, get past that point. Now you're doing yoga Pilates at month three and weeks nine and 10, you're having uh, progressive overload with strength training. So most people get a little frustrated here because you know, by week six in a traditional post-operative model, this is where you start to, you know, load individuals. Uh, and this is, is it gives you a little bit of freedom. Wait one to two more weeks before you start to, uh, to introduce the progressive overload. And that's because this is a very particular, uh, technique and it's very sensitive. You don't want to have people going through this, a very expensive, very expensive procedure. And so, uh, in typical timelines at week six, you would start to introduce this. So you can bump that back two more weeks and that allows them, you know, that time to allow the stem cells to do their magic um, and allow that, that cellular process to happen. So progressive overload uh, at weeks nine and 10, and then slowly return them to running uh, and any form of uh, walking or jogging progressions um, at weeks 11 and 12. So you can see this progression. Um, and once you pass that 12 week mark, that's when you're going to start adding a lot more progressive overload and then uh, uh, continuous running so just remember at months four to six that's where you're really getting into a strength and conditioning uh, component here and then return to sport a ramp up time of three to six months so this procedure has to be well thought out in advance. If you're getting an athlete or a patient afterwards with no thought of how long they wanted to get back to sport, uh, this guideline will give you, you know, get them to that first month with no aggravations, passive range and active, assist, active assisted range of motion. In months two, you're starting to slowly introduce isometric, isotonic uh, exercises and, and, and start to introduce yoga, Pilates, any form of uh, very light aerobic or uh, stationary work. And then months three is when you start to progressively overload them and slowly bring uh, build into a return to sport or excuse me a return to uh, run program so at weeks um, uh, 16 to um, uh, to 24 is where you're pushing the envelope to return to sport so all in all your ultimate goal here is to safely transition people there will be a lot of nuances well, when do I start the you know the banded work when do I start them at 90 90 when do I start them uh, in hip flexion several uh, techniques but ultimately that's for you to decide, uh, this is a general guide as you work through, uh, work with individuals who have conditions that you know you can help, uh, do no harm, uh, slowly introduce uh, these things as you go on and ultimately allow them the healing that they need to be able to be successful. So um, if you guys have any questions about any of these techniques, uh, you can uh, send them my way, uh, Dr. Chris at drchrisgarcia.com. Uh, this is a procedure and technique that requires a lot of effort and uh, a lot of planning. Uh, and you, if you find yourself stuck, uh, send me an email. Um, I can share anything that you might need uh, as you navigate patient cases. I'm always excited to help. Uh, and I wish you uh, the best and uh, good luck with your rehab process.